Hey guys, and welcome to the Alabama Saltwater Fishing Report presented by Angelo Di Paola, the coastal connection with EXP Realty. The first podcast to bring you the local inshore, offshore, and onshore fishing report, whether it's good, bad, or ugly. All right, folks, welcome back to the Alabama Saltwater Fishing Report. I am your host, Butch Theria. We have a great show lined up for you guys this week. But first, let's hear who's making the show possible. This week's Alabama Saltwater Fishing Report is brought to you by Sportsman's Marine. Sportsman's Marine has an extensive tackle selection of anything that local anglers need for saltwater and freshwater fishing, as well as boating accessories. They have the largest selection of the slick lure in Mobile and Baldwin County. They have AFTCO, Pelagic, and Saltwater Fanatics apparel along with other local brands. Go check out their Edgewater, Wellcraft, and Vexus lines of boats. They offer engine services with five-star Yamaha and Mercury mechanics. Also, if you're looking for a street-legal electric golf cart, go check out their Atric Golf Carts. Sportsman's Marine on Highway 98, and they also have a downtown location next to Mr. Gene's Beans in Fairhope, Alabama. And also brought to you by Bahio Sunglasses. Want to catch more fish? Experience the clearest lenses on the planet with Bahio Sunglasses. Because you'll see more, you'll catch more. It's as simple as that. Try on a pair at your local retailer or check out BahioSunglasses.com to witness the magic for yourself. Bahio is an independent, sustainable, carbon-neutral sunglass company based in New Smyrna Beach, Florida. Hey guys, and welcome to another special episode of the Great Days Outdoors Podcast Network. This week I'm joined with Butch Theory and Butch... We decided to go in depth on something that has really come up a lot in all of our fishing reports, and that's why we want to go in depth on it. Doesn't matter what part of the world you're fishing in, making longer casts can be something that you should want to know more about. Whether you're an inshore guy, an onshore guy, an offshore guy, there's been plenty of times in my life where I wish I could have cast just a little bit further. I couldn't quite reach the fish. I could maybe visually see them. But what I'm learning after we do podcast after podcast is that probably more than likely, there's been a lot of times I should have been making longer casts and I didn't even know that it was hurting me. It's been interesting to see how, whether we're talking about Northwest Florida, Alabama saltwater, this is something that all the really good guides are telling us we need to focus more and more and more on. Yep. Agreed, man. It's going to be a really good show. We have two guys that are wealth of knowledge in the fishing and in the rod building industry. I'm excited to get into it for sure and learn a lot today. Yeah. Who we got coming on with us today? Yeah, Joe. Today we have Jim Icing. He's the marketing director and technical consultant, as well as the rod father of God spacing, from what I understand. <laughs> we also have Captain Bobby Averscado, the A-Team Adventures, the Marshal of Mississippi Sounds. We have plenty of expertise in the building today. Guys, welcome to the show. I mean, before we jump into really why you want to cast longer and how to do it, uh, Jim, why don't you start out by telling us about how you got into this and what you do over at Angler's Resource? Well, I've been in the uh, outdoor marketing business for many, many years. I, I owned an ad agency in Jacksonville that specialized in hunting and fishing products for uh, about 15 years. And then came over here to go to work for Angler's Resource in 2010 as the marketing director. Had never built a fishing rod, knew nothing, called guides eyes, like yeah. so many other people do. <laughs> and uh, I've, I've learned everything from the ground up. The leg up I've had is that because of our association with Fuji, I have been able to, you know, sit and have dinner with the engineers and inventors that develop these products that know exactly what problems they're trying to solve. And that has been a, a huge advantage and put me in a position just being an average guy to know uh, as much or more than most people about what you're trying to accomplish when you build a fishing rod. So I got a leg up there and, you know, I'm active in forums and Facebook groups and a lot of people ask me a lot of questions. I, I have to thank the Fuji engineers for that. Well, I'm looking forward to asking you a lot of those, a lot of those questions. You've probably gotten them all before, and uh, we're going to record it today so that we can uh, maybe help you in the future not have to answer so many. But <laughs> that's right, <laughs> Bobby. I've got a question for you. So you know, I mean, we can talk about how to cast further, right? I mean, we're going to get into all those things, but I think it's very important before you get you know, on any kick to do anything is you got to understand the why. If you don't know why you're trying to do something, then you'll just look for an easier how-to and a different how-to. So the most important thing is why should we want to cast further? Why is it so important? 
Well, first of all, it's I think it's you know it's, it's a great topic to be covering today because it is so important. Probably the biggest one you know single thing I would say is is, is particularly if you and then we're talking mainly about shallow water applications here is um, the further you can get away from the fish, the less chance the fish has knowing that you're there. And if you you guys all fish enough to know that fish do two things in their life they either eat or they keep from being eaten that's the only two things they have to do in their whole life and they don't do them at the same time so when something's not natural to them they go into that keep them from being eaten mode <laughs> and not eating so if you can get whatever you're throwing to them in front of them before they know you're there you got a lot better chance to catch them and that's the single most important reason why it's important to make long casts and when you're in a shallow water application even though you think you're being quiet, you know, we're showing up in these big old bay boats that are real slappy and they got electronics running and sometimes live well pumps running. You got power poles and rolling motors and all this stuff. And we're jumping up and down on the deck and all of that sound, tr you know, translates through the water a long way. So, you know, again, the gist of it is just, you know, being able to get the bait to the fish before the fish, you know, know, know you're there and go into that not being eaten mode. You know, Bobby, you're talking about, like you said, more of a shallow water application, but I see it in other for you know other areas too. I mean, like I think out, you know, when we're blue water fishing and throwing a bop popper to yellowfin tuna that are coming up on top. I mean, sometimes you just can't get to them. Ling comes to my mind big time when you're trying to put a sneaky cast on one. Yeah, or or our surf guys. You know, sometimes they're trying to yeah, get true. out past that second sandbar and they you know don't want to have to wade out in the cold water and do it. So. I, I definitely think there's applications in all types of fishing. You're coming at it today, you know, from, from that shallow water perspective. Is there a goal to shoot for in terms of distance, Bobby? Like, I mean, if I jump on your boat and you cast further than me, is that a problem? Or are we trying to look for a certain amount of yards? How do we know when we've reached long enough? Well, I, I, JoJo, I'll tell you exactly what I tell my charters. The first thing I tell them is don't hit me when you cast. That's rule number one. <laughs> The second thing, I tell them they can hit each other, just don't hit me. The second thing I tell them is the one who casts the furthest is going to catch the most fish. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I can't say, yeah, it's great that you can cast 75 yards or 50 yards or whatever it happens to be. Whoever casts the furthest is going to catch the most fish, and that's generally the theme. So that's, you know, I, I couldn't, like, specifically put a number on it. But as we get more into this, you know, that we're going to talk about here shortly, but, you know, with some of the stuff that Jim's going to touch on as far as materials – I go to great lengths to set the my equipment up so they can, you know, so it's easier for them to make a long cast. Right. So, you know, it's not really a number of saying, you know, throw it this far. It's throwing as far as you can. I want you to throw it as far as you can throw it. Yeah, further is better. The longer is better. The, the one who the one who throws the furthest is going to catch the most fish. That's the way I that's the way I put it to them. So don't be afraid. Now, you know, we're gonna we can get into a whole deal of where. You know, we get into like sight casts and accuracy casts. For, that's a whole nother show. But, but you know, generally speaking, the stuff that I'm gonna I'm doing with the the people that I take, and even when I'm tournament fishing, the majority of the time we're doing everything we can to cast as far as we can, whether it be to cover more water or, like I said, to, uh, you know, to keep your your presence unknown to the fish. It, it, you know, the further you can cast, the better you're gonna do most of the time. Yeah, always go back to what Captain Richard always says. If we cast 200 times or 500 times in a day, and I can cast five foot further than you each time, I mean, that's at least, you know, 6,000 more feet or something like that. <laughs> that's probably not how the math works out. <laughs> I'm not so good with the numbers. I, I know him well enough that he had to have a calculator to do all yeah, of that. Yeah, but, yeah. The, but the point he's making is he's, he, he's covered a lot more water than you have. You know? yeah. Exactly right. Guys, let's take a quick break and take a minute to check out some of the businesses that keep this show free for you each week. Boaters List. Boaters List is your new reliable and fast resource designed to link everyone to everything on the water. If you own or run a boat, you know how difficult it can be to find the right company for the task at hand. Boaters List makes it easy to find the service that you are looking for. Locate anything from fuel docks to service repairs or rentals of large yachts, even down to paddle boards and all things in between. BoatersList.com will always strive to make it better on the water. And also brought to you by, that segment was brought to you by Hilton's Offshore Charts. The days of heading out and blindly looking for good fishing areas are pretty much over. Don't waste time and money on fuel searching for fish. You need the most recent, highest resolution images to not only know where to go, but where not to go. The knowledge provided by today's technology is critical when planning an offshore fishing trip. Make the choice that professional captains all over the Gulf make and choose Hilton's Real-Time Navigator. 
The easy to use interface and excellent customer service will have you on the fish every time you go. Check them out at hiltonsoffshore.com. So Jim, if we're talking about long casts and that's what we're talking about today, and we want that to be our focus, what do we need to be looking for in a fishing rod? I know we can break it down per component, but just starting out at the basics, you know, what do we need to be looking for in a fishing rod? Uh, in the situation Bobby's talking about where he's trying to make a long cast, uh, a lot of times you're fishing a popping cork and a, and a shrimp and maybe a split shot. And you, you really kind of need to consider the total weight of the package you're trying to throw because one of the most important things in a longer cast is properly loading the rod that you're using to cast whatever weight. I mean, you can build a rod perfectly that, that's gonna cast a half ounce is gonna be the sweet spot. And if you put a three eighths ounce bait on there, you're gonna be frustrated all day long and complaining about how far it casts at the end of the day. It just doesn't feel right, it doesn't work right. And the reverse is true. If you put too much weight on a rod, you feel like you can't put all the power you need to into the cast. You feel like you're not moving the rod fast enough to cast it as far as you can. So. I always recommend to people to try to find the sweet spot as far as lure weight goes. Beyond that, if you find the sweet spot, the next best way, as, as far as I'm concerned, to increase distance is to downsize the line and or go to braid. Braid is limp, it's smaller diameter, it goes through guides faster. So consequently, it's gonna cast further. You're putting, when you load a rod, you're putting a certain amount of energy in the lure. And once that energy is expended, it's not gonna go any further, no matter what you do. So you've gotta, you gotta put the whole package together with the line, the lure weight, and you know the blank and the way the guides are positioned on the rod. But, uh, Joe, let me add one more thing to what sure. you think to that to kind of answer. I know we we're on gym, but there's, you know, when I heard your question there, one of the first things I thought of was length of the rod. You know, the longer the rod, the further you're going to cast it because you can generate more tip speed by, you know, the longer the rod. The problem is you run into is you can't take a 13 foot rod out there and throw an eighth out. <laughs> there's got to be a trade off you know somewhere. So, you know what I'm saying? So there's a, like, and this kind of is getting into what Jim was talking about, but very generally speaking, you know, the longer the rod, the further you're going to cast it, you know, again, but it's got to be matched up with the, the amount of weight. You see those guys with those big surf rods, they got, I don't even know what size weights are putting on those things, but they're giant, you know, but the downside, if you go too long is you lose that feel too, when you're actually trying to catch the fish, you know what I'm saying? So, you know, in addition to what everything that Jim just said, which makes a lot of sense, you know, that's the other thing you'd, you'd consider, you know, is the application you're going to use rods for, you know, I have, the luxury of being a rod builder too. And so I build rods specific to the application. The first conversation, I, I, I'm going to go off into a quick tangent here, but the first conversation I ever had with Jim, I had never built a rod, but we were talking and I said, yeah, I want to, um, I'm going to start building a, a few rods. I want to build, you know, just about a dozen or so just to have some good, you know, specifically popping cork rods. And, and he told me this, and I never, I tell everybody this when they talk about getting into rod building. He said, be careful that rod building is a lot like crack. You get hooked to it. So my two dozen rods or a dozen rods, I think I'm up around 250 now. So, wow. but what I was getting with all of that is um, I build my rod specific to the application. So I'm fortunate enough that I build, you know, popping cork rods. I build slick lure rods. I build top water rods. I build jig rods and they're specific to the application. And it makes a big difference, you know, so getting to like the popping cork rods are my rods where I don't care about feel it's a visual indication of a bite you know what i'm saying so i'm watching a cork go down so i build those rods long those aren't the ones that i'm you know use for a jig so i think it's important that we add that in there too when we start talking about setting the actual rod up to make the longest cast you can bobby i'm really glad you you brought that up because now all i got to do is go back to my wife and say see i don't have a problem like this Bobby's guy's got saying. 250 rods yeah. like i've got I'm not even you can have as many as i want so, I obviously need more, actually. Uh, you're depriving <laughs> yeah. me. And if you want me to be a happy spouse, you'll allow me more fishing rods. So, but <laughs> Let me know how that goes for you, Joe. Joe. <laughs> she catches so, more fish than you anyways. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> so, Jim, back to the sweet spot, right? Like, if we go to the store and we grab a rod off the shelf and we see that lure weight and it says, all right, it's a quarter ounce to three quarter ounce is the, is the lure weight. Is the sweet spot in the middle of that? I mean, how do we figure out a sweet spot? You almost have to 
put a lure on and cast it. To, and you'll know, I mean, you can feel it. You'll, you'll feel like you can do anything with that lure mm -hmm. if it's in that spot. And there will there'll be a range slightly one way or the other, but there will seem to be one particular lure that works exceptionally well on the rod. I don't know how to describe that because I don't think lure weights are really that accurate. By the time you take a quarter ounce jig head and put a, I mean, you put a four inch tail on it, it weighs one thing. You put a three and a quarter inch tail on it, it weighs something else. Who, who knows? But you can, sure. it's definitely something you can feel. The other thing I didn't mention a second ago that has a lot to do with distance is the, the weight of the overall rod. Now people refer to that as speed. And what we mean by that is you simply can't move a heavier piece of equipment through the air as fast as you can a very light piece of equipment. So when you get into a higher modulus graphite type blank, a carbon fiber blank that might weigh half what an e-composite blank weighs, you're, you're gonna move it faster. When you move it faster, you load it deeper and you're gonna gain distance in the cast. And those carbon fiber rods are stiffer. They're, they're more brittle, they're more fragile. Yes, we all know that nowadays. We didn't when they first came out, but we know it nowadays. But keep in mind, this is something I learned early on that's always stuck with me. All, all a fishing rod wants to do is return back straight. That's all it's trying to do all the time. It's trying to get straight again. So you bend it, you load it, you put all that energy into bending it by how fast you're moving it. And all it wants to do is get it straight. And that's what actually launches your lure. So the more brittle the material, the stiffer, I shouldn't say brittle, it sounds fragile, but the stiffer the material in the blank, the stronger its tendency to return to straight position. So you get extra power, extra speed and extra power in a carbon fiber blank that you don't get in a lower modulus carbon fiber blank or an e-glass or a glass blank. You can just move them faster. And they're so much lighter that they're much easier to fish for a, a long time on a flat with a popping cork. There's no, there's much less fatigue factor in a lighter blank. And, you know, weight is everything. They're more sensitive. You don't need that with a popping cork, but you do in a lot of other situations. For sure. But uh, weight, sweet spot. Maybe Bobby wants to address um, casting <laughs> technique. That's something that's certainly important, but it doesn't matter how good it is with a poorly built rod, you're not going to cast far. Uh, but if it's a well-built rod and you have got a cruddy technique, you're not going to cast far either. So that certainly plays into this as well. So the more, when we're looking at a power rating, to go back to what you were saying, the stiffer a rod is, the more power it's going to have? Yeah. Well, now, yes, that's, it's no. That's <laughs> not right. <laughs> I'm I glad. I'm, I'm glad. Hey, I'm, hey, whenever I'm at For the sure. store can, and I'm staring at the rod rack, it. I'm always like, hmm. Yeah, yeah. No, no. You can, you can take carbon fiber and you can build it to be, to be very soft and have almost a parabolic bend. It won't have an extra fast tip or fast. It could bend in the midsection. It could bend all the way to the handle. And you could build that on carbon fiber and make it very light. So no, the power is not related to whether it's carbon fiber or glass. What you can do is you can add power to that carbon fiber without adding the weight. So that's, that's where it starts to make a lot of sense. So Bobby, I'll ask you that question in a different way. If we're looking at the power of a rod, I mean, what do you look for for a rod that's going to make longer casts? I like the way you guys are breaking down mm -hmm. speed. All right. You know, like you said, Jim, the weight of the overall rod, a lighter rod casts further. Bobby, like you said, length, the longer the rod, the further the cast. When we talk about stiffness, so what about power? What do we need to look for in the power of a rod in terms of making longer cast? Uh, you know, I, Jim covered it probably way better than I could, but the gist of what he was talking about is, you know, if you had like a really very soft action rod, like he's talking about like a glass rod or something, you're not going to get nearly the casting distance you would in like a, a rod that's, you know, a bit stiffer and maybe even has a faster tip. So, you know, I, I couldn't, I, there's not a whole lot I can add to it, but what I will talk about, uh, you're touch on just a little bit, and I hope we don't get past this a little bit when we start talking about rods and, and setting them up before we get into actual casting techniques is, you know, again, I may be getting ahead of us, so, so bear with me, but I thought it'd be real important to go like almost talk a little bit about 
you know, not only just the raw power, but the God spacing and that sort of thing. And, you know, if I want to hear Jim, I, he's told me about it and I understand it, but I, I think it's really important that we touch on that because when you start talking about God spacing and laying the gods out, particularly on a spinning reel, you know, so it lines up and that sort of thing, that's going to add, that's going to do wonders for the casting distance alone. That's why we call him the godfather of God spacing, by the way. <laughs> that's where he got the name. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Back to lure weight. Lure weight needs to be mentioned in that. You talk about power. Well, you, you can't pick a big, powerful blank and cast a quarter ounce grub with it. Right. You can't do it. You can, you can only effectively work with a quarter ounce grub or a three eighths ounce grub if you've got a, a rod that's made to cast that amount of weight. So power is going to always be relative to the lure weight. Can gotcha. you follow what I'm saying there? Yeah, right. Like, <laughs> yes, I mean, sir, definitely. To some extent, you have to measure all these things. Now, this is where you get into action. If you've got an extra fast action, the top third is going to be where most of the bend occurs. So you can have a huge amount of power in the lower section of the rod, but you can still cast a smaller lure because the top section is going to, is going to load for you when you're trying to cast a lighter lure. Does that make sense? It does, definitely. <laughs> It's all about taper. It's about the taper of the blank. If it gets real small in the top, you can take a really small mirror dine and you can, I mean, you can flick it a long way with a medium or a medium heavy blank if you've got a flexible enough tip. But if you've got a rod that's got a moderate action and the bend occurs in the middle section of the rod, you feel like you're trying to cast with a broomstick when the, when the lure weight is too light. It's frustrating and it'll wear you out. It's, it's all got to work together. Yep, definitely makes sense. And I would think the inverse is also correct. Absolutely. Yeah, you don't want to overload an extra fast top. It's all got to work together. Like Bobby's mentioned, it's once you have all that going for you, then you've got to put everything in the right place. And then you've got to look for another kind of sweet spot, which is what happens when you cast. How does the line move? when you make the cast so that's another issue so jim you you know you we've talked about speed we've talked about length we've talked about power we talked about action and then you alluded to it is now it's how that line travels through those guides tell me about god spacing i guess you're going to kind of say it depends right oh yeah, yeah definitely <laughs> it depends on it depends on a lot of things <laughs> i guess that's why they when you go to see a custom rod builder this guy's going to ask you all these questions. He's going to know what you're going to do with the rod, and that's going to influence the spacing. It's going to influence the blank. It's going to influence the power, the action, everything. I mean, but let's assume that you know what you want to do with the rod. Let's talk about the millions of people who are not custom rod builders who want to go buy a rod that's going to work well for them. First of all, you need to figure out what it is you're going to do with it. I mean, if it's going to be a pop and cork rod, based on what Bobby said, it's going to be seven six. I use an eight foot high modulus blank for popping corks and it's fantastic. You talk about range and power. Mm. Let's say you're, you know you're looking for a seven foot six inch rod. You know you want the lure weight to be around an ounce because maybe your popping cork weighs around an, around an ounce no matter what you're gonna put on the bottom of it, whether it's a voodoo or a live shrimp or whatever it's gonna be. So you need a, and you know that you probably want a, a medium action rod so that you can really load it. You can't snap cast a popping cork rod. You've got a, it's almost a lob. It's not the flick that you can use with a slick or a grub or something like that. So you're looking for a medium action, a medium power, moderate action, seven foot, six inch blank. Figure that stuff out before you go to the store. So then you, now you can go in there and shop. Take the reel you're gonna use with you to the store. Find some blanks that fall into that category. Normally, you're going to pay more for a high modulus carbon blank. Go ahead and pick up a couple of those and pick up a couple of less expensive ones and take them over to the counter and mount the reel onto the rod. Take the spool off the reel. When you take the spool off, you're going to expose the axle that the spool rides on. If you'll put the axle on the edge of the counter, line up the axle with the edge of a counter, you will see that that rod travels maybe 20, 25 inches, and then it comes off the counter because all spinning reels angle upward toward the blank when they're mounted. That's the direction the line wants to travel when it comes off the spool. 
So it seems logical, although it's done not nearly enough, it seems logical that the guides should be on that line. So now you've got half of the rod that's on the counter and half the rod off the counter. What happens after it comes off the counter doesn't matter. Those are called running guides and all you're trying to do is get the line to the tip of the rod and, and get the lure launched. What happens between the edge of the counter and the reel is where you have to take that big giant coil that's coming off that spinning reel and you've got to reduce it down to smooth running line by the time it gets to those running guides. And if you do that effectively, you add tremendous efficiency to the whole system because you take out as much friction as possible. All we're talking about here is friction. If it's poorly built, you've got friction on all the guides, you've got line slap in the blank, you've got all sorts of sources of lost energy before you even get to the top of the, the tip of the rod. And you've only been able to put so much energy into that lure. So if you sacrifice it with line going through those guides, slapping the blank and getting all messed up, and it looks chaotic. If you look at it, it looks very chaotic. But if you can manage that and get it out, you instantly add distance to the cast. So put the reel on the rod you're looking at and see when you line up the axle on the edge of the counter, see if the three guides, the three reduction guides that are the first three guides of that spinning rod are also on the edge of the counter. If they're not, that rod is not going to perform as well as one where the guides do line up on the counter. Because when the line comes off the spool, it's headed in a direction. You don't want to change that direction if you don't have to. Am I too far in the weeds now? No, no, I'm, I'm paying <laughs> no, attention. I'm soaking it all up. I'm also kind of thinking too, like this is a good opportunity where, like you said, you're taking the reel you intend to use, right? And you're trying to yeah. match it up to a rod, but it's also a situation where you could say, maybe I need to get a different reel for this rod. I mean, is, is there... Oh, yeah. Oh, you can definitely do that. But you're still faced with the same matching issue. You still got to match the, right. the rod. You got to match reel. the reel to the rod. So it's not necessarily a question of the type of reel or the, the way it's constructed. It's more about the size and the dimensions. and It's about the angle of the spool axle right. paired with any particular rod. And the that's size of the spool. But that's the size of the spool can make that first guide vary a little in size. But generally speaking, for the 2,500, 3,000 series reels that we use here, you're going to be fine with a particular size stripper. But if, if you can get those lined up, if you can find one, it's not necessarily a brand thing. You may find a bargain. There's, you know, there's a lot of good imported high carbon blanks that don't have those familiar brand names on them that may work beautifully with a particular reel and be half the price. And you'll be happier with one of those than you will paying top dollar for one that's just not made to work with the reel you're trying to put on it. Yeah, that's great advice. Jimmy, I'm gonna, I want to jump in and say something about what I see happen a lot with the people I take when they bring their own rods or, or, you know, a lot of people. And you just touched, you just nailed it right there when you said what we're talking about here is, is uh, the size of the reel. And Joe, you mentioned it too. You know, you'll get a guy, I'll have a guy that shows up with this brand new rod and he's got a 4,500 size reel on it. And it's a little seven foot you know, <laughs> rod and, and you, you know, so it, when you go down and size the reel, basically it changes that, it changes that angle of that spool of the um, axis that Jim was talking about. So the smaller the reel, you know, the more it's going to line up with that X that you create, like he was talking about when you put the rod on the, on the counter, you know, so, you know, basically what you want to do is just get the right size reel to, that's what you're going to have to do is change the size of the reel to get it to match up the rod that you want to buy. And, um, and that's the biggest mistake that I see when people show up is they'll show up with a, typically it's a way oversized reel. Jim said 2,500 or 3,000. I use all 2,000 size reels, but, um, you know, and we're, t we're going to be talking about line here in a minute, so we won't get in too much into that. But, you know, for, for what I'm doing, which is speckled trout and redfish, you know, to, with braid, a 2,000, 2,500 size reel is more than enough you know, for what I'm doing. And so that's what I see, at least with, uh, with people when they select their reels or, or they get a real bar, they just go throw a rod on it and, and it just, and there's no way it's going to match up. And that's another thing that creates those dreaded wind knots when you, that's a big problem there. When you start putting those giant reels on a small rod, uh, God, where that axis doesn't line up right is that's what creates those wind knots. I get people say, oh man, that's all I get is wind. Well, that's all, that has a lot to do with, you know, having the wrong reel on the wrong rod. Guys, let's take a quick break and hear from this week's sponsors. 
Bucks Island. They have new pontoon boats, bass boats, bow riders, and aluminum boats for sale. They provide boat service on all kinds of boats, even if they weren't purchased from Bucks. Visit them at 4500 Highway 77 in Southside, Alabama, or give them a call at 256-442-2588. And also brought to you by... MB Ranch King hunting blinds and feeders are built to last right here in the USA. With durability and convenience in mind, MB Ranch King's maintenance-free blinds are constructed with high-grade steel and come in a variety of sizes to meet any hunter's needs. They offer high-quality, easy-to-use corn and protein feeders that can be filled with both feet on the ground. Call Kevin today for more info or a quote at 205-807-2937. MB Ranch King, built in the pursuit of perfection. Uh, it's really interesting to hear both of you guys talk about this because I think a lot of attention gets paid to singular components of this right. whole system. Really nice you know, rod like, or, and or really nice reel. You got to have braid, you know, you, you got to have braid. whatever on there. You know, or you got to you gotta have this rod or whatever. And what I'm hearing you yeah. say, Jim and Bobby, is it's all about, first off, you got to match the rod to the reel or vice versa. And that's really right. going to help you. But what about guides? What about guide spacing? Like when we met you uh, at ICAST this year and talked to you for a while, man, you were showing us some stuff with some super small little micro guides. There was <laughs> way, way more of them on that rod than what I'm used to seeing. So well, what's going on there? Think about how big is the knot that you're trying to cast through the guides? How big is it? What do you think the diameter is? I would, well, I, just depending on what I'm tying, I would say it's going to be – Th- like almost three times the diameter of the line you know? <laughs> yeah, right which is not very big so no it's not very big that's going to pass through any guide you ever put on a rod mm-hmm. a bit, i mean a three and a half millimeter guide would accept any knot you're going to tie between braid and fluorocarbon would it sure. not sure yeah especially okay. when we're talking about you know inshore but what are the advantages of smaller guides they do manage line a little better in other words they smooth out the flow of line from those three big reducer guides we talked about, they smooth out the flow of line at the top of the rod. What they really do is they take weight out of the tip section of the rod. When you take the weight out of the tip section, you add sensitivity, you move the power curve lower in the rod, you can fish it longer without getting tired. There are just so many advantages to reducing weight in the top section of the rod that the smaller guides have just taken over because they, when that guy designed that blank, when he designed that blank, he had a certain bend in mind. He had a certain feel in mind. He had everything that he wanted that blank to do in mind for a particular purpose. And then you take it and you put guides on it. And every change you make in the weight of that blank changes the original goal the guy had in designing it. So the less weight you add in the top, the closer you're going to be to what he designed it for. But mostly it's about sensitivity. You start taking weight out of the top half of a rod and it is, it's incredible what kind of sensitivity you gain. You feel everything better. You feel blades turning lips on baits. You, you can tell the difference that when you change from a shell bottom to a mud bottom. I mean, it's incredible. It, it is absolutely incredible. And they cast better. And they cast longer because the line is being handled more efficiently. Because you increase your speed. You increase your speed on the cast because there's less weight to move through the air. Right. Like you said, the faster you're moving it through the air, the longer your cast is going to be. So you're just decreasing that weight. The other thing we haven't touched on here is frequency. If you mounted a blank on the wall horizontally and you twang the end of it, it's going to oscillate. It's going to oscillate at a certain point. Then it's going to come back still. If you do that with a glass blank, it will sit there and wobble and wobble and for the longest time. You do that with high carbon fiber material and it'll, it'll just and just stop that dampening effect. So how does that translate into a longer cast? As long as that rod is waggling back and forth, that line is banging off the blank. It's banging off the outside all around the rings of the guides trying to get to the tip. And it's taking, it's, it's creating friction. It's taking energy out of your cast. If it pops into almost still position after one or two oscillations, everything starts running smooth and everything goes further. So there's just, it's a whole combination of incremental advantages that translate into 
substantially more distance when you get it all put together right. Yeah, the whole package is what it sounds like. Yeah. Jim, let me ask you this. So when you start talking about friction too, this is kind of an interesting thing I learned when I started building rods, you know, exactly what you're talking about. But if you go to the store and pick up a production rod, say a seven foot medium action rod, and you count the guides on it, it's going to have seven or eight guides in the tip. You know, when you start building a rod, when I'm building one, I have all my seven foot rods. I'm going to have more often than not, I'm going to have 10 guides in a tip. Why would, why would the production people not put more guides on on the rods like you would as a uh, custom made rod it's strictly a cost consideration bobby they just want to be that's kind of what i was getting at right there yeah that's because putting the guide number one the guides depending on what you're using is that you know believe it or not is a fairly expensive component depending on what you use but the other thing is the time consuming part of building a rod is wrapping those guides especially when you start doing multiple colors but the other thing that was interesting when you're talking about friction you know the the other thing that you would think common sense would say okay if that line's touching the inside of the guide, would not fewer guides be, have less friction than more guides? All competitive casters are using as few guides as they can possibly use on the rod. Hmm. Com- distance casters are using as few guides as they can, but they're not fighting fish. Ah. Uh, yep. You've got to set up a rod to manage a fish. You've got to keep the line close to the blank Fuji does a demonstration. This is the most fascinating thing. They take a rod with three guides on it and they take a rod, I think it's a six and a half foot rod that's got like nine or 10 guides on it. They mount them in a little carriage and then they put two liter Coke bottles full of water across the floor, maybe 15 feet away. And then they say, set the hook with each one of these rods. When you set the hook with the rod with 10 guides on it, I mean, that two liter bottle comes skating across the floor toward you. When you set the hook with three guides on the rod, it moves about two feet because what happens is the tip collapses toward the butt and the line runs straight between the guides. So it looks, it's called a bowstring effect. It looks like the rod is all bent over, but the line is straight between the two guides. So it looks like a bow and your power just melts out of the blank because you're not moving any line when you're setting a hook or fighting a fish. So putting enough guides on there to make the, the line track the bend of the blank maximizes your hook set power and takes up more line if, you, if the fish throws slack in your line or, you know, the advantage of having, being able to take up as much line as possible, uh, but mostly on the hook set. It's mostly about a hook set. More guides give you a much more powerful hook set. I think it'd probably be too, when we start talking about, before we leave the subject of friction on the two, I think it'd be a great time to just touch on some of the the difference between the materials that the guides are made out of now, Jim. Uh, Yeah, Fuji has uh, a huge selection of ring material. Uh, Some of it is built to be abrasion resistance. We've got a silicon nitride that is wireline proof for uh, if you want to fish it offshore and wireline reel, that stuff, that silicon nitride is used as... uh, Ball bearings and jet engines is that. Tough. And then we go to an alkanite, which is a, a blend of aluminum oxide and some other materials. And we go to silicon carbide. Most of, the, most of the actual ring material comes out of the abrasive industry, oddly enough. But what happens is when you polish it enough, it's almost as hard as a diamond. It's like, I think SIC is the second hardest material out there. And Fuji makes rings out of SIC. They also make rings out of Torzite. Torzite is completely proprietary. They won't even tell us what's in it. But it is, I mean, it's babied and it is highly polished. The the more polish on a ring, the slicker it's going to be, the less friction it's going to create. There's not a Fuji ring out there that won't stand up to braided line. None of them will groove. The le- from the least expensive to the most expensive. But the Torzite is, it's a very slim ring because it's extremely durable. So there's less weight in the guide. And then it's highly, highly polished. So it is slippery as it can be when you make a cast through it. It's expensive. The size 40 double foot RV in titanium. I'm working on the price list now for ICAST. So I saw this the other day. It's $175. Per guide. For one guide. <laughs> So you put 10 of them on a rod. That my mind. No wonder those but, guys want so few guides on their rods as they can. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's a surf rod guide, and you won't see many of them, but that's how far you can go. 
it's just like any other sport, you know, yeah. a set of golf clubs or a bowling ball. It doesn't matter. You can spend as much money as you want on it. But it boils back down to friction, right? I mean, friction the- every time it comes to friction. Yeah. Gotcha. Absolutely. Like Bobby was just saying, you put 10 of those dang $175 eyes on a rod. <laughs> right. yeah. Ooh, man, you have to take out a mortgage on that thing. Yeah, right. Absolutely. Yeah, you hadn't even gotten into the most expensive component, which is the blank, you know? So you're, yeah, just, right. you're just talking about the guys right there. Yeah. Well, let's talk about that a little bit. So I've had a few custom rods built. It's a fun endeavor when you do that to get something back that is, is what just what you asked for, right? And I then, remember that really nice one you had that actually threw over. Remember that? Yeah, I do remember that. I had a, <laughs> it, was a, it was a wedding. It was actually my wedding present, guys. You know, like yeah, I had a, uh, somebody that got me a really bad. nice custom rod, and Butch and I were fishing for Cobia, and I guess I guess Butch just – maybe I offended him in another life. He just – He was jealous. He dropped it yeah. overboard. But uh, anyway, Sorry so about that. having have ordered some a few custom rods in my life – I've been happy with them, but I think part of the reason I was happy with them is that they meant something to me, you know, or they were gifts or things like that. I never Mm. knew how to go in and order a rod. And like you were saying, Jim, you know, like how to go to a store and pick a rod. Mm -hmm. That was a great example. But, you know, if I wanted to go talk to a custom rod builder and have a rod built for a specific purpose or build one myself, if I'm into that. What does somebody need to do if they're walking into that rod builder shop? Do they need to have their reel and their intended lure? You know, they have a popping cord. What, how do you really do it? Because when I've done it, it's like they handed me a blank and they were like, how does this feel? And I'm like, feels pretty good. All right, yeah. let's go with that one. Well, you shouldn't have worked with that guy. <laughs> <laughs> if you go to a local rod builder, he ought to know exactly what blank has been successful in whatever situation you want to tell him about in a, mm-hmm. in a given fishery. And then he should know all the questions to ask you to build a rod exactly like you, you think you want it, but you don't know for sure. Handle length, uh, how big your hands are. Should you use a 16 or 17 size reel seat? Uh, do you grip the reel between your middle fingers on a spinning rod or between your little finger and your ring finger? Do you fish palming type reels on casting rods? Um, he, he should be able to ask all the questions. To, and then if you have a quirk or... You know, everybody's fishing a seven six flipping stick, and you want a seven three. Then you, that's all you should have to tell him, and he ought to be able to pick a blank and figure out all the parameters that are going to fit you the way you need to be fit. The other good idea is to take a take a rod you really love into the rod builder and say, "I love this rod." Mm-hmm. There are ways to measure a blank. If you don't know anything about what you're asking for. A good rod builder should be able to measure the blank. There are some techniques for measuring power and action that will get you pretty close to, we have standards in the industry that uh, rod builders know about. So they should be able to reproduce the blank that you say you love fairly closely and then get the handle just right. You want a split grip or solid grip? Is it going to be in a, in a rod holder? I mean, there's a hundred questions. The biggest thing is just telling them what you're going to do with it. Well, and, and Joe, I, that's what I was going to say. You can't get away from it because that he Jim's already probably the first question that would come out of the uh, the mouth would be the broad builder's mouth would be what are you going to be doing with it? And you said that earlier already, right. but I think that's probably that's probably the first thing I'd ask is what are you going to be doing with it? The first question that ever, that you have to ask because people never tell you to start with is spinning or casting. Right, right, true. <laughs> for some reason, people oh, yeah, mention by, that. By the way, and you got to start by there. The way, <laughs> <laughs> yeah by the way <laughs> you want the reel on top or you want it on the bottom i right. think i forgot to ask you about that i want it on the top i reel backwards You're right i need to uh circle back as they say to the when we were talking before about going into the store and buying a buying a rod um you've got your reel in your hand you've put it on the countertop you've seen whether or not the reduction guides are going to work for you why at that point if you're getting ready to spend two or three or five hundred dollars on a rod why can't you put the reel on the rod and go out in the parking lot and cast it yeah that's the final recommendation that's a lot of money to spend on a fishing rod tell that guy to walk out there with you i won't give me a practice plug i want to go outside and cast this thing and when you do you will know instantly if it's the right rod because great advice 
I have spinning rods that I can cast as hard as I can cast them. And I can't even hear the line going through the guides. There's no vibration. It's just quiet. It's smooth. The tip damps down and it's still in three oscillations and the lure just rockets out the tip. Those are the things you're looking for when you go to the parking lot. Yeah. It's like hitting a baseball. If, if you ever hit a home run, you just don't even feel it hit the head of the exactly. bat. You know, it's just perfect, a perfect cast, same a perfect thing. hit, same kind Sweet of Sweet spot. Yeah. Yep. Yep. You know, back to one thing, Jim, you know, we're talking about if you're talking to a custom rod builder or if you're walking into a store looking for that rod, that's going to get you the furthest cast maybe the most important consideration is what you're going to do with it, right? Like what reel are you going to use? You're going to throw popping course. You're going to throw the lure, all those kind of things. But the thing I see a lot, and this is, this is everything because everybody's trying to save money, right? So what does everybody want? Well, I want a bay boat, but I need it to be able to get into <laughs> six inches of water. And I mean, but I do want to be able to run out and catch some snappers. So, you know, as long as it could soak up like a four foot sea, not and I get don't me want wet. To get wet. I right. want to stay dry. You don't want to get wet. And it needs to have seating on the front because my wife likes to go out to the sandbar, you know, like, you know, just that boat. <laughs> right. Yeah. Right. It doesn't yeah. exist. I mean, <laughs> there's no such thing. And then, so, and, then, and then I want to chase redfish in eight inches of water. That's too, right. Yeah. Yeah. Way, so. yeah. So I see the same thing with rods. Everybody says, well, you know, I kind of want to get like a rod that I could use for popping corks and then, you know, tie on like a jig and a grub. And they just want to fish with one rod or they want to get three rods and that, that's their setup. So, is there a do it all type rod, you know, and, and I don't want you to get in necessarily specifics, but like if you're trying to make a longer cast, it sounds like you need to build a rod for that purpose for that bait in mind, not get caught up in trying to get one rod that does a bunch of whole bunch of stuff. I think, I, I, I don't know. I think Bobby will probably agree with this. You, you do need to build a pop and cork rod, mm -hmm. but right after that, if that's going to be what you do mostly, and that's the first one you want to build. Bobby, wouldn't you say a seven foot medium would, would a seven foot medium fast yep. would yep. do almost everything yep. you need to do in Mobile Bay? That's exactly what I tell people. If they go like, if a guy says, well, I got a small boat and I only need, I can only carry two rods or I, I, you know, I just want one that I can go from a top water to a grub to a popping cork. I tell them build them a seven foot medium action. That's like the all purpose general use you know it's good for this it's good for this it's good for this it's not great for this it's not bad for this but it's good for everything and that's exactly what i say is seven foot medium action yep i think i think it's very versatile blank perfect that's good stuff so we talked about spinning reels and rods a ton i really liked how you broke it down about going up to the counter and getting that axis you know on the on the counter and trying to figure it out that way is there anything if you're looking at a you know a bait caster instead of a spinning reel is there anything that's kind of the same matchup or what are you looking for as far as is the differences? Are they pretty similar as far as matching one up? Well, what we didn't talk about on spinning guides also applies to casting guides. This Fuji developed a, a whole new angle on spinning guides a few years ago. They realized that uh, height was the most important consideration in, in constructing a reduction train on a spinning rod but that they could use a smaller ring on a higher frame and get this whole reduction thing done faster. So they developed a thing called the KR concept. So now where you used to have a, a 30 millimeter ring to get a frame high enough to line up with that spool axle we were talking about earlier, now you can get a 20 millimeter ring that's the same height and it has revolutionized spinning. They carried that over to casting and where you used to have a 10, 12, or even 16 millimeter ring as a collector guide, they call them, the first, the first guide off of the reel. Now we have high frame six millimeter rings that perform better than the big 10s and 12s we used to use because they manage the line down to the running guides faster and when you've got a line that looks like a stream of milk running through those running guides, everything gets better. But casting guides, generally, the guides are on top. And that, well, we're really getting into the weeds here. That, <laughs> it creates a torque in the top of the rod. You've experienced the snapper fishing with the guides on top of the rod. You got to hold on to the rod real good because it wants to flip over. So for casting rods, 
you've got to have the smaller guys have a lower center of gravity. So there's less torque out of them. And you've got to make sure you have the right number and you position those guys with the rod under load. It's called static loading. You bend the rod in the shop and you put the guides where they need to be, not from any template or any formula on distance, but you put them where they need to be to track the blank when it's in a 90 degree bend and the line is held from going below the blank when it's under load. You don't want the line to drop under the blank when the, when the blank's bent. So you need enough guides on a casting rod to keep the line on top of the bend. There's no magic spacing for casting rods. That little six stripper I was telling you about, that collector guide, is going to be about 19 inches out on just about any palming reel you ever pick up. And then after that, all the guides are positioned to hold the line on top of the blank under load. They're very simple. Yeah. Casting cap, very simple to lay it. I know you've seen that offshore, Joe, trying to snapper fish and the lines going yeah. below the blank and all that. Oh, yeah. You think about, like, I've seen it a lot, you know, especially if you got a really big yeah. fish on that. Like that amber jack. Got, there, yeah. there, Hey, there's a custom technique called an acid wrap. Yep, where I've seen that, too. Stripper is on top. The next one's at 60 degrees. The next one's at 90 degrees. And the line actually spins all the way around to the bottom of the blank. And then all of the running guides are facing down. And it completely eliminates the torque in bottom fishing. It's a fantastic innovation. And I'd highly recommend it for any bottom rod. All right, guys, let's take a quick break. Check out a few of this week's great sponsors. Advanced Transmission. Give the professionals a call who have been trusted on the Gulf Coast for over 25 years at 251-626-6061 or check them out online at www.advanced-transmission.com. And also brought to you by Test Calibration. If your diesel has low power or is consuming excessive amounts of fuel, these are common signs that your turbocharger may need to be rebuilt. Don't waste your money online with the cheapest options where you get no support after the sale. Test Calibration has been selling and servicing diesel, turbochargers, and fuel injection systems since 1976. No matter if you're running a diesel in your boat, tractor, or truck, Test Calibration can help you. Contact them at 800-822-0057 or visit them online at testcalibrationdieselandturbo.com. So let's talk about the reels a little bit. Bobby, if, if I said to you, Bobby, we're going to have a casting competition and the winner catches the biggest speckled trout, are you grabbing a bait caster or a spinning reel? Well, I'm a, you know, it depends on what I'm doing. If I was He's grabbing a <laughs> yeah, He can almost throw as far as I can. <laughs> you know, it depends. If I'm using a popping cork, I'm going to use a spinning rod. But anything else, I'm going to use a casting rod. You know, so it just kind of depends on what, I, what I'm going to throw. You know, if we're going to be throwing slick lures or top waters, I'm throwing a cast and reel. You know, it's just because what I like to do, and I can work the lure better with it. And I can throw a cast and reel a pretty long ways. Um, oh, my God. You know, with the, it's with, unbelievable. You got to see his thumb. <laughs> you know, and, and that's, you know, part of it is the reel itself, and part of it's the line, and part of it's the way the rod's built and that sort of thing. But I just think that uh, one of the things that I've learned with cast and reels you know, way back in the day, the original casting reels we used were these big round reels, you know, and the, and the, and the, um, the paw followed the worm gear in the reel on the cast and on the, when you retrieve, obviously it's got to, so it can lay the line onto the spool. But the newer reels, I say newer guys, they've been around for a while now, they disengage the paw when you cast. So that paw is not moving back and forth as you're casting. And that adds a tremendous amount of casting distance to the reel because the line doesn't, I mean, the, the line doesn't have to wait on the pole to move back and forth. You follow what I'm saying? In yep, other words, when you, when you disengage these reels now, that thing just sits right where it was, the, mm -hmm. the pole where the, the, uh, the line goes through. It just stops right there. And so, you know, like if you gave me that challenge, and I, I hadn't kept it a secret for any particular reason, but I know that when I know I have to really rear back and make a super long cast, I reel up to where that pole is at the dead center of the worm gear and then disengage the reel. That way the line doesn't have to travel from one side of the spool all the way back across, you know, the complete distance all the way across the spool. It's only going halfway, you know, from one edge of the spool through the center of the guy, then back over to the other side. And it'll add a good bit to your casting distance. Hmm. Um, I don't know if you can kind of picture what's going on right there. Well, you could tell us that secret, Bobby. Oh, yeah. We won't tell anybody. That's right. It's not. It's not really a. It wasn't really a secret. It's just something that I do. But uh, anyway, the the reels that I use, and I'm sure that the uh, the other man, I use Abu Garcia, you know, casting reels, 
and they do that. And the new pin squalls, which are some new ones that I'm using, do that. And I'm sure a lot of the Shimano's and the Daiwa's do that as well. But that's one of the things that I look at on the reels that didn't used to be that way as to where you could, when you cast it, that pause moving back and forth is the reel split. So you can imagine how many times that thing's got to move on each cast. And sure. if they don't have to do that anymore. And so um, that's been a big thing for me, in addition to, you know, to making a long cast with a casting reel. And then the other thing, too, is you can get into, you know, now with the brake systems on these reels, you have mechanical brakes and magnetic brakes, and then you have little tweaks that you can do between them. And so what I do, I take the brakes completely all the way off mine. I back them all the way off. And, um, and then I just kind of make minor adjustments based on what I'm going to have to do. Um, we're going to talk about techniques, I guess, here in a little bit. But, um, you know, when I know I got a pretty good wind behind me and I know if I'm wading, I don't have to worry about hitting anything behind me. I got everything backed all the way off, you know. Heaven help you if you hit a seagull or something when you cast because that's the end of the day for that reel because the line explodes, <laughs> you know, which going out so fast if it, if it hits anything or whatever happens, it's the end of the day for that reel. You're, co- you're not trying to – when I throw a backlash – it isn't one of these kind of deals. Let me sit down and pick this out. It just gets retired for the day. Right. You ain't getting it out, you know, when you, you, when right. you got stuff set up like that. So there's a lot of technology in the reel that will let you make really, really long casts that I take advantage of. And those are just a couple of them right there. And those are available in any, just about in any reel nowadays, Those some of those features. Yeah, so you're not necessarily going into the store and saying, I got to have this or I got to have that. It's It's one of those things that just about all your major manufacturers have stepped up to the plate in those regards to make a reel that'll get you where you need to be. Yeah. yeah any kind of quality reel. I mean, you, you can, you know, if you buy a $39 re, uh, casting reel, it's probably not going to have magnetic brakes and centrifugal brakes and that sort of thing. And um, it's not going to have some of those features I was mentioning, but if you, you know, you go and spend a hundred or $150 on a casting reel, it's going to have everything you need to make those adjustments to make those longer casts, you know, and it's a big deal, you know, to me, again, it's, it's real for the type of fishing that I do most of the time, it's a big deal to be able to make those long casts, both with a spinning and a casting reel. And, you know, what we're talking about with rods on speed is a lighter reel going to add to a longer cast. I mean, because a lighter rod does, I mean, does that equate the same way? No. I, think, I don't think it would. Yeah, it would. Now, it goes to that where Jim's talking about that fatigue factor, you know, having the lighter, the materials that are available now and making it. I think it's more of a fatigue factor thing. But to me, I, I don't see how that would, would affect casting distance, you know, yeah. having even though the reels now I've gone pretty much all to low profile reels, which takes a lot of the weight out of the reel. But that's more of just from a fatigue standpoint. You mentioned that Paul and how it uh, automatically disengages when you make the cast. Is, is there anything to look for in construction or design differences in a spinning reel that will lead to a longer cast? I mean, there is some, there is a big variance in what you can spend on spinning reels. And I always have wondered, like, I mean, I don't know, you know, I've, I've caught fish with the Stellas and I've caught fish with the regular old, you know, run of the mill uh, type spinning reel and i couldn't notice a whole lot of difference when i was fighting the fish just being just being honest so i'm just always curious like what i'm actually paying for can you pay for distance and casting the way you can pay for speed in a car i don't think it's much of a case in spinning reels uh i think the main thing is what jim talked about earlier setting it up so the so the real ma- uh, the spinning reel so it matches up with the with the reduction train in the on the rod i think that's the big thing as far as like casting distance goes i don't think you know uh, I think what you're paying for when you start going from one end of the spectrum to the other is in terms of price is the number of bearings and some of the drag systems and whether or not the bearings are sealed and, you know, and so on and so forth. There's a lot of things you're paying for there, but I, those aren't things that are really that are going to help you with casting distance, you know, as far as with a spinning reel. But I think with casting reels, like I said, there's a few things you can look for in a casting reel that will make a difference. All right, guys, let's take a quick break. Check out a few of this week's great sponsors. Fishing Chaos, fishing tournaments coming up near you. Do you fish in a club? Do you manage a club? Does your club hold fishing tournaments? If the answer is yes to any of these, now is the time to reach out to Fishing Chaos. Get your club listed and managed on Fishing Chaos now for free. Contact Jesse Wilson for details at 256-508-1853 or go to fishingchaos.com to schedule a demo. And also brought to you by Dixie Supply and Baker Metalworks. 
Dixie Supply and Baker Metalworks are proud to be your metal roofing headquarters for over 40 years. Save time and money by buying from the most reliable manufacturer on the Gulf Coast. Buy it today, pick it up today. With the addition of their new store in Cantonment, Florida, they now have eight locations to serve you. Dixie Supply and Baker Metalworks, your metal roofing headquarters. So we talked about rods and we've talked about reels. You mentioned it earlier in the show, Jim braided line what do we need to know about line to get more distance on our cast and and bobby you know you don't always use braided line so i'd like for you to you jump in and, and talk about maybe where you're using fluorocarbon or mono and does that hinder your cast or, or, or are there certain types that you feel help with your casting yeah bobby uses a lot of fluorocarbon i use braid a lot on spinning rods but yeah it has a, it has a huge effect because the lighter and or limper the line, the easier it goes through the guides and the easier it goes through, the less friction it creates and the more distance you get on the cast. So that's probably the fastest way, Bobby, you probably would agree with this. It's probably the fastest way to gain distance is go from 20 braid to 15 braid. Yep. I think it, cause what you're talking about there is reducing the diameter of the, yeah. of the line, which gets back to your whole conversation about friction. And that's exactly right. You know, yeah, one of the things yeah. that's, that's yeah, going from braid, you know, obviously you're reducing the diameter, you know, you're talking about from usually a 20 pound braid is about eight pound t- uh, diameter is equivalent to about eight pound diameter, 15 pound braid, six pound diameter, so on and so forth. So you're, you're dramatically reducing that diameter of the line, which reduces the, num- the amount of friction in the line. And then like Jim sa- uh, said too, just because the braid doesn't react with the temperature and that sort of thing, you don't get that coiling effect, no memory in it. So it just lays limp, goes through the guides real easy. One of the things that about fluorocarbon though, that needs to be mentioned is it's, it's a very slick material. So even though you're going to go up in diameter, it goes through the guides really, really well. And as long as it's not super cold, fluorocarbon versus mono, not to the extent that braid is, but fluorocarbon versus mono doesn't have that memory. So it stays real limp, you know, for a non-braided line. So it, it casts extremely well and, um, you know, compared to mono, you know, and uh, you don't, you, you, you know, you obviously, like I said, you're going up you know, diameter wise, it's pretty much the same as mono. You're going up there, but you've got some other advantages that don't really involve casting length that we won't talk about here, you know, in this segment that we're doing today. But as far as casting goes, you know, that's what I'm going to have on a reel that I have to make a really, if I know I'm going to be wanting to make some really long casts, I'm going to have fluorocarbon on there on a casting reel. But all my spinning rods have braid on them. Interesting. So if you're, if you're needing longer casts out of a, and you're using a casting reel, you, you are going to fluorocarbon line. I go to fluorocarbon line. I could probably accomplish similar things with braid, but now we're getting into what Jim mentioned earlier where, you know, okay, I'm going to give up a little bit of casting distance because I like the way that the fluorocarbon works with the lure and I like the way it fights fish. I, I don't, being a trout, old timey trout fisherman, you know, I don't like the feel of a big trout with a line with zero stretch on it. You know, I want that line and that rod to have a little bit of give in it when I get a big trout on there. So, you know, I'm going to give up maybe a little bit of casting distance from that braid, but you know, because I still have to fight a fish. Like he talked about earlier with the number of guides on there, I you still got to fight a fish. So I'm going to fluorocarbon because I want a casting distance, but I got some other features that, that help me catch the fish. Another comment, Bobby, on fluorocarbon versus braid, and it goes back to the way each works with a high modulus carbon fiber blank. Some people feel like even though they add the sensitivity and the distance and the casting and they have all the advantage of high modulus carbon, that they're too stiff. They feel like fish come unpinned because of the stiffness in the carbon fiber. You can put fluorocarbon or mono on a high modulus blank and build a beautiful shock absorber back into the system. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. So the, so the gist of it is the stiffer the rod, the more give you want in the line or vice versa. You may want to. So on my spinning my long spinning rod it doesn't bother me nearly as bad having that braid on there with no stretch because i got this big big long rod that's got that becomes like you just said a shock absorber and the Mm -hmm. same thing with my jig rods you know if i needed to have that that rubber band effect i can go to fluorocarbon which has about 10 or 12 percent stretch or even mono which has 20 plus percent stretch and now you got a rubber band on there with a stiff rod you know you know, in a perfect world, what I always say is I'd rather hook a fish with braid and instantly somehow or another be able to turn it into mono because <laughs> I want to hook the fish with the braid. <laughs> yeah. 
and then fight the fish with mono. You know what I'm saying? I love the way yeah, mono yeah. fights fish, but I, I'd rather be able to stick them and cast with braid. So, Jimmy, you need to come up with that, man. That's a great invention. Just <laughs> push a button. And... Stretchy braid. I'll work yeah. on that one. To take it back to what, what you were saying, Jim, earlier about going into the store, having your reel to match it up to your rod, it also sounds like if you really want to get into this, you need to be matching up not only your reel, but also your line. Because if you are like Bobby and you really want to fish fluorocarbon line, you may want to choose a different rod than if you were choosing braided line. Is that right? Yeah, possibly, yeah. Yeah, you might want, yeah, and there are, yeah, there are p plenty of people that will choose the, the weight of e-glass over carbon fiber because of the softness. Hmm. I know for years people, people said, well, you know, trout have a pretty soft mouth. You don't want one of those stiff new carbon fiber rods. They're too stiff. Well, that's not true. I think we've, that's, that's kind of been dispelled, but um, yeah. We get back to that word package again, don't we? Mm -hmm. That's right. It's all a trade-off. You just got to figure out what works for your application. It, it is all so interlinked that you've just got to be real careful about the way you put the whole package together. But boy, when you get it together, you really, you really got something. But it's line, you know, it's going to be line, blank, guide train, reel, lure weight, and the list goes on. Well, we talked about a lot already. We've talked about the different ways you want to set up a rod. And, and the different things you want to look for. We talked about different types of reels, things you want to understand about them. You guys talked a lot about line. I learned a lot on, on talking about line, but also how that line works with your, your rod to help you make a choice. What else can we do when it comes to getting further casts? I mean, Bobby, is there anything we can do uh, with our technique? You mentioned earlier about, you know, disengaging that paw just dead center right there with your rod blank, lining it up with those guides. Is there anything we can do with our technique or with our boat positioning? I mean, what are you thinking about that's maybe not related to the rod and the reel and the line to help you get longer casts? Well, the obvious thing is to use the wind to your advantage, and that's a huge deal for me. I, I, a lot of times I have people that aren't experienced in making you know long casts or casts of any kind for that matter. So, man, if you can take advantage of that wind, it's a big, big deal. And so what I do, you know, when I know where I'm going, I go to great lengths. Sometimes running, you know, if I see a set of slicks or some birds or, you know, a point I want to drift or whatever it is, I figure out how I can get the boat around, you know, said target without disturbing the fish and then set it up to where I can start coming, you know, approaching whatever I'm going to be fishing from upwind so I can take advantage of that wind. And it's a, it's a big, big deal for me. Uh, I do it all the time. If I can avoid casting into the wind, um, I do it at all costs. You know, sometimes you can't. There's certain situations where you can't. If you're going down a little creek or something like that into the wind, you know, and you see a redfish or whatever, you know, or you're trying to work your way back to a pond, some, sometimes you just can't do it. But if you fish in open water, um, whether it be a river or a bay or anything like that, there's ways that you can run around the fish or you're planning on fishing and get set up from, from upwind. And, man, it adds – especially when you start talking about something that's not very aerodynamic like a top water or a, or a popping cork for sure it adds a tremendous amount of casting distance to the cast you know so that's that's the very first thing the by far the most important thing that i would say from a, from a technique standpoint is to, to figure out a way to get what you're going to do set up so you can cast down when, when i'm wade fishing if i get a bank a beach i want to wade I look at what, which way the wind's blowing and um, put the boat, you know, way upwind from where I'm going to wade and make my way downwind, you know, the whole time going downwind as much as I can. Even if it's in an angle to the shore I want to, I still want that wind coming over my shoulder to add to the casting distance. That's the biggest thing that I, I would say that I would recommend doing, you know, to, to improve your casting distance. Don't, I see it happen all the time. People, there's no reason a guy could have, you know, loop gone up a river a little ways and start fishing back down instead of going with the trolling motor right into the wind. And the next thing you know, the guy's picking out a wind knot or a backlash or something like that. When he could have easily just looped right around and started drifting down with the wind. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's one of those things that we hear y'all talking about it constantly over and over and over looking for yep. the best place to fish that wind, not just fishing a spot you know, like you've got spots and, and that can really help you, a Spot, yeah. you know, like you need to look for 
okay, you maybe know this is a spot, but how can I fish it in a different as the wind changes, or do I have spots that are going to work for a north, an east, a west, a south wind, uh, and and having yourself set up to do all those things, Bobby? If we're trying to make those long casts with the wind, how important is it to be? I mean, right on the money. If we're if we got a north wind to be casting due south, I mean, can we get away with trying to cast southwest or 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 southeast yeah and you have to be able to yeah you have to be able to unfortunately you know the fish aren't always and more often than not they're not directly downwind so if you're casting i used to say generally with the wind you know just i don't want to cast straight into it i really don't like casting across the wind but you know generally with the wind is usually what i tell them and i start you know i get up on the bow and i start the whole deal in the morning and i kind of spread my arms at about 45 degrees to the wind and say, guys, this is kind of the area that we're going to cast right here. So yeah, this, you know, so I, you know, when I, again, I, I, you know, in a perfect world, every cast could be straight down wind because when the lure hits the water, the cork hits the water, the line's instantly tight, right. you know, but as we all know, as anglers, that never happens or very rarely happens. There's a, they're always a little bit over here, a little bit over there. You know what I'm saying? So, yeah. uh, but yeah, but just, just generally, generally downwind. So focusing 10 to two, is probably where you want to be thinking about if you're, Yep, that's a good number. Yep. That's a good number right there. Bobby, I wanted to ask you if you ever actually plan your charters around (laughs) wind direction. I mean, I know you've got four or five good spots, but you'll pick the spot. You'll pick the spot where the (laughs) wind is right. I would, I would think. Is that right? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Oh, abs. All the time, all the time. Uh, you know, it's uh, there's just certain areas that fish better. There's areas the way I'm gonna have to set the boat up, or if we're on a wade trip, you know, there's certain areas that I want to wade on certain winds. So yeah, but probably usually when I get a call from a long, you know, ways out, a guy say is booking in February for a May trip or a June trip, and they start dwelling on tides and moons, I go like, uh, don't worry about that right now. The biggest thing we got is weather, and there's no way we can predict that you know, where we're going to fish and what we're going to do is going to be based on what the, basically what the weather and more specifically what the wind's doing. So yeah, it's, you know, all the things that people talk about to me when they talk about, you know, conditions, I always tell them you can wrap up all that stuff and all that stuff together does, means less than the weather. The weather is by far the most important thing. More specifically, like I said, is the wind and the wind direction and velocity. So yes, absolutely. The probably the biggest determining factor on the side where i'm going to go guys this has been an incredible segment there's so much knowledge it's been flying around uh mr jim thank you for being on the show today um, wealth of knowledge in the fishing industry as well as the rod building industry i know you have a rolodex full of custom rod builders if folks want to get up with you and reach out and try and pick your brain or maybe get pointed in the right direction on a rod or a custom rod what's the best way to get in touch with you if you need to get in touch with me right info at anglersresource.net. And I do, I know a lot of custom rod builders and they're rod builders that are working on the Gulf Coast, know what uh, someone needs and uh, I'd be happy to to put them in touch with somebody. Captain Bobby, we appreciate your wealth of knowledge. As always, if folks want to get up with you and book a trip, what's the best way to get in contact with you? Well, Bobby, hold on. Bobby, when is it going to be like a, you know, like I want an east wind in May? Slit call. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> where did we book that trip yeah yeah well it, it, that's one of the questions i ask is uh is do you want to catch big fish or a bunch of fish you got to pick one or the other and so what joe's asking me is <laughs> that's right. i want to go catch a bunch of big fish okay well i do too but you, <laughs> right, you got to okay. pick one or the other <laughs> uh yeah you can get us at a team all one word a team fishing.com and there's a uh contact us tab on there that gives us uh give you a phone number a little form you can fill and you can ask all those questions that uh joe was just asking about what's the best time i can go get set, right. set a state record for Perfect. speckled trout so That's just right. know that day and i'll be there you can even put that in there right. <laughs> well gentlemen as butch said thank you guys for joining us and uh it was fun Man, you thought going into a store and buying a rod and reel was just as simple as picking up one and buying it didn't you man i like the way that thing jiggles Ring me up. Right. <laughs> I would say, where do you even begin? But those guys really were really able to break it down, you know, as far as um, if you're just a, a recreational angler that fishes, you know, once a month or whatever, you know what I mean? Kind of like you, you don't fish that much, but 
Well, the way I break it down would be like this, Butch. Like, if I wanted to beat just beat you in a long casting contest, I would probably just go to the store, just grab anything. I'd probably close my eyes and just grab something off right. and win. But if you're going to beat Bobby or Richard, then you need to really beat Bobby Richard nerd into it and right. No, I, I, it, all kidding aside, I, I, that's what I really liked about this. Is you could be as high tech as you want, and those guys filled you in on whatever you need to know. But then you could also walk into a rod shop and just say, "I need about this," and sure. still have come out with a really, really nice setup. The way those guys talked you through everything. Yeah, I mean, exactly. If you want to use this show to go pick something off the shelf, you got it. If you want to use this show to go to a rod builder and make the longest cast you've ever made in your life, you you can do that too, yep. and. It's going to take going back and listening a little bit, though. But I'm going to have to listen to it several more times. Yeah, I've been taking notes. And I, I mean, again, the thing I really learned from this is that it's just not a one size fits all approach. You can't no. just say go buy this one and that one and get this line. And I mean, you really got to look at it holistically and say, all right, line to reel to rod, the whole package. And then what am I going to be throwing? You got to think about all of it. So great show. Yep. Keep whacking them. Be safe out there, buddy. All right, folks, that's going to wrap it up this week. You guys, please subscribe, rate, and review wherever you listen to podcasts. If you'd like us to email you the podcast each week, just text the word fishing to 314-665-1767. Again, just text the word fishing to 314-665-1767. Subscribe to our email list, and we'll send you the new show each week. You guys keep whacking them. We'll talk to you all next week. This week's Alabama Saltwater Fishing Report has been brought to you by Fish Bites. Since 1999, Car Specialty Baits, Inc. has been busy revolutionizing the fishing industry with their game-changing brand of baits and lures called Fish Bites. Check out the full line of scented saltwater and freshwater baits at fishbites.com. And also brought to you by l and Marine. l and Marine has something for everyone from small hunting boats, pontoons, as well as bigger bay hybrid boats for the hardcore angler. Go visit them at 34600 Highway 59 in Stapleton, Alabama, or call 251-937-1380. Also brought to you by Advanced Transmission in Spanish Fort. Give the professionals a call who have been trusted on the Gulf Coast for over 25 years at 251-626-6061 or check them out online at www.advanced-transmission.com. This week's Alabama Saltwater Fishing Report brought to you by me, Angelo DiPaola, The Coastal Connection. Find us online at thecoastalconnection.com. And also brought to you by Admiral Shellfish. Admiral oysters are available at select restaurants. They can also be purchased by the public at Bon Secours Fisheries, Inc. and Ahi Seafood in Fairhope, Alabama. Call for availability. Admiral Oysters will steal the show. Follow their adventures on Instagram at Admiral Shellfish Co. And also brought to you by, and also brought to you by Photonis Defense PD Pro Ultralight Ultra Compact Night Vision Systems. Simply the best in class night vision systems ever built. Contact them at photonisdefense.com to learn more. Photonis Defense, Masters of Darkness. And also brought to you by Sam Stop and Shop. Sam Stop and Shop is your one stop shop located at 27122 Canal Road in Orange Beach. Sam's has a little bit of everything, including a deli, inshore, offshore, and surf fishing tackle. They also have bait, clothing, groceries, name brand sunglasses, and so much more. Stop by and shop or call them at 251-981-4245 today. And also brought to you by Richardoni Family Dentistry. Do not let an achy tooth ruin a day on the water. Call today to book an appointment at 251-342-6672. Also brought to you by 